And hello, everybody. Welcome back here on the KSAM Sports Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Carlos Zimmerman. The other side of the table has our other host, my good friend and broadcast colleague, Jordan Smith. As always, we got a lot to talk about on the show today, primarily about the uh, sport of baseball, uh, because that's what's been going on right. lately. We've got a bit to talk about here. Of course, the trade deadline has come and gone. Everyone has made their moves, even the New York Yankees. They were the last one to really make any sort of move. Right. And then, of course, what happened on trade deadline day for the Houston Astros and Framber Valdez getting and making history, getting a no-hitter, and that's what we're going to talk about right now to open up the uh, podcast today. I mean, what a night in Houston at mm-hmm. 2 o'clock that afternoon. You bring Justin Verlander back from the New York Mets, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and then seven and a half hours later, Framber makes history for the Astros. It was a fun night. I caught literally just the ninth inning. And that's obviously all that mattered at the end of the day was right. getting to catch that ninth inning. And, and what an outing for Fromber for a guy who had had back to back really struggling starts for the Astros, giving up 10 combined runs in the two previous starts. Mm-hmm. And then he comes out and shuts the door on Cleveland. Yeah, nine innings, no hits, no runs, seven Ks and one walk. That was the biggest thing. 307 ERA with a 9 7 record now. His uh, actual stat line during the game 97 pitches. Apparently, it's the only no hitter. Uh, since the turn of the century, I believe is what I saw, that has a no-hitter under 100 pitches. So that is something to – that's something to write home about. You know, um, it's not – and then not only that, he's the first Astros lefty in franchise history to do it. And I didn't realize that – I mean, I guess you look back on it and it makes sense, but the Astros got a lot of no-hitters, yeah. 16 in total. And apparently that, according to MLB, is – the most amount of no-hitters for a single franchise out of any team in all of baseball right now. The Dodgers are second, but they're like four behind. Since 1962, since the Astros existed, that was the graphic I saw. Right. So over the last 60 years, Mm -hmm. we have the most no-hitters at 16, including Frombers. And it's not surprising when you go back and you look at the names. You you obviously had Nolan Ryan with a couple while he was in Houston, or when he was in Houston, one of his seven, five, whatever. Whatever, one of his a lot. Yeah. Um, you had Verlander with two thus far, and we'll get to that later on. Uh, let's see, maybe he throws another. In mm-hmm. one. Uh, you got Framber Valdez, obviously. Uh, you got Mike Scott to win the West. Um, you got four combined no yeah, hitters, basically. Uh, Durker, another one. You know, you got a lot of names. You even got no hitters dating back to the Colt Forty Five days. Mm-hmm. So. You know, there it's a long range of of history. Uh, yes. Obviously, with with the Ashes and and uh, good pitching, uh, that's something that I think has usually been not mo- not every year, but good amount of years. The Ashes have had some kind of notable arms in their rotation, not just in the Golden Era, but period. Period. Yep. You, we've always had an ace on the staff. I mean, come on, even in the bad years, in the one hundred loss seasons. Bud Norris was your ace, and he was still, you know, fairly serviceable. He he was good in his prime. Yes. He was good in his prime. Yes. So, yeah. I mean, and, you know, the Astros offensively on uh, Tuesday night didn't even really need to put out that much. Kyle yeah. Tucker had a two-RBI single in the third, and that's all the Astros needed to be able to get the win because Fromber was just, you know, guns ablaze. And, I mean, his no-hitter is a Maddox mm-hmm. being inside 100 pitches and um, also facing the minimum. Facing the minimum, yeah. yeah. Almost a perfect game. Almost a perfect game. It was a walk in the fifth to Oscar Gonzalez, mm-hmm. and it was on a 3-2 count, too. Yeah. So he was literally one strike away from perfection. It would have been the second perfect game of the year behind Domingo Armand's earlier yeah. this year and when he perfected the athletics, if you will. Mm-hmm. And so Fromber was close, but still a no-hitter. Regardless, it's great. Um, it's the first Astros solo no-hitter. Since 2019, when who? Justin Verlander. Yeah, and it's funny you mention that because even with all that, we'll dive a little bit deeper when we get to all the trade deadline talk. Um, the fact that literally they got Justin Verlander at about 2, 3 o'clock, whatever, 2 o'clock mm-hmm. Central Time, they announced the trade for Verlander. Seven and a half hours later, no hitter. Yeah, it just it worked perfect. It, <laughs> it was it was too good of a day. For it Houston. was poetry in motion, <laughs> it to, was, to it was say the good. least. And now the uh, now a day has passed. The Astros were able to sweep Cleveland yesterday. 
Uh, and they still sit half a game back of the division lead uh, to the Texas Rangers because the Rangers decided to trounce the Chicago White Sox yesterday. As everybody should. Yes, absolutely. I mean, they're 43-66. and 66. They should be doing that every given week. Big sellers at the deadline. Absolutely huge sellers, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Obviously, the Astros, they're hitting the Bronx tonight to take on the Yankees. Justin Verlander is joining the team there. He is... Not scheduled to start tonight or Friday, so potentially he's supposed to a start Saturday. in New York. That is what Jim Crane uh, apparently, through reports, told Verlander is that he is starting against the Yankees. Now I don't know if that's changed because that was reported on the day they got on deadline day when they got Verlander. All these reports of the text messages coming out between Verlander and teammates, Crane to Verlander, saying we'll see you in Houston. You're going to pitch against the Yankees, whatever, but. Um, so, so as far as I understand it, he's supposed to be pitching against in the Bronx against the Pinstripes. But uh, so as yeah. of this moment, Javier gets the start tonight. And that game's going to be on Fox. Then Hunter Brown gets the start tomorrow against Severino. Saturday, I believe when I last look, ha- it has a TBD on it. So that would be Verlander. I would believe that. I would. It would behoove me to believe that Verlander would be that one. Or it could be Sunday. It's a four-game series. So he, they got, you got TBDs on I think, both of those. I think that's when they're going to reshuffle the rotation a little bit. Because right now you've got six starters in that rotation. Right. You know, with your Kitty coming back, you have six starters. This is an interesting broadcast series. Because, like yeah. I said, tonight's on Fox. Tomorrow it's on Apple TV+. Plus. Uh, Saturday is uh, local networks, so Sportsnet Southwest, and yes, and then Sunday is on AT&T, but it's also on Amazon Prime Video. So I'm I'm intrigued as to how that's going to pan out wise, but, you know, obviously I'll be watching tonight, see if the Astros can continue their good fortune and everything, and then we'll, you know, we'll see what happens from there so with that said i'm going to dive now into the trade deadline talk here ladies and gentlemen looking at how everything panned out for the astros over or for the astros and really all of the major league baseball so the big one of course for the astros getting justin verlander and then sending to the mets they're going to get they got verlander and they're getting cash in the trade and they're sending to the mets top prospects in outfielder Drew Gilbert and Ryan Clifford, but it was a big thing to be able to get the services of a guy that's first off coming off of an AL Cy Young and, you know, a guy that has brought a lot of success to the city of Houston and for the Astros. A lot of people thought that the haul that we gave up was maybe a little steep, but, you know, I saw something come out the other day that, um, you know, the outfield depth that the Astros have is just astronomical. So to be able to get rid of a not get rid, but like remove a couple of guys out of that order, you still have a good chunk of outfielders in your farm system. So I thought it was still, you know, a really good trade to right. be able to bring Verlander back to H Town. So first off, I hated your astronomical joke. Mm-hmm. That that was that was painful. I wasn't even trying. Oh, I know. I know. That's what I saw in your face when you said it. That, mm-hmm. It disappointed me. I'm also proud. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, I'm going to be honest. I would have loved to see, and I've said this before, I would have loved to see Gilbert, uh, Drew Gilbert uh, in the outfield for the Astros. That was something I was excited to, to to watch. But, again, the fact that you're only having to give up two outfield prospects and the fact that a majority of the contract that Verlander signed with the Mets is getting paid by the Mets, that's the biggest win in all of this, and the reason why, for me, the reason why the Astros win the trade. Because if the cash isn't in there, you could argue the Mets win the trade. Mm -hmm. Because if the, the, the money's not in there, they offload a contract and they bill for the future. But because of the fact that the Astros were able to and got approved by Major League Baseball, because the money had to get approved before it was finalized, the fact that the Mets said, yes, we will pony up more than 50% of the remaining contract, including money from the vesting option that could Mm -hmm. potentially go in place in two seasons from now. That is why the Astros won the trade, because they basically got Verlander at what they were wanting to pay him at originally, cost-wise, if not maybe a little bit less than the offer they were wanting to give him this past offseason before he went to New York for more money. So the Astros basically get him back. Now everybody's saying, you know, yeah, they made a mistake. They lose two outfielders. They could have done this in the offseason, whatever. Let's be honest, they couldn't. No. They had the money, yes, they had the room to do it, but 
they also needed to see what they have because you got a ton of pitching prospects. You know, a guy like Forrest Whitley, I was surprised he wasn't traded at the deadline. I figured he would have been somebody who would have shipped in a Verlander trade, for example, because I figure if you're the Mets, you're going to want a pitcher, whether a prospect or whatever, for Justin Verlander. Yeah. It, it makes the most sense. The two outfielders, whatever, kind of questionable. Um, but not so much when you hear reports coming out as of yesterday, I believe, or two days ago that, uh, or I think it was yesterday, that the Mets are going to look to ship Alonzo uh, in the off season. So watch that as a winter meeting trade, potentially. Um, so it makes a little more sense when they're just getting outfield prospects because of that report, as long as that holds true. But, yeah, I mean, I, I'm interested to see what the Astros do with Forrest Whitley. Um, I'm interested to see if they still believe in, in you know, that that project, that, that prospect or not, um, or if he's somebody who gets shipped to support the back end of a, a bullpen that has a couple guys on option, like Hector Neres, for example. He's got, I believe, a club option. Um, you got a couple of other players as well going as undrafted free agents. You know, who knows if you're going to be able to bring them back or not. Um, so it'll be interesting to see, I guess, with that, um, how they handle Forrest Whitley if they decide to keep him and develop him and see what they have, or if they try to trade him uh, maybe for another veteran guy um, next year or what. I don't know. But either way, the point being, this is a very good move for the Astros. Yes. You know, it, it, it brings back somebody who had a lot of success with you. The two and a half seasons he was with you from the rest of 17 to, or I guess a little bit more, it felt like two and a half, but it's, he was with us from 2017 through last year. So, so that's what, three five, and a half, four years? Half of 2017. Yeah, 18, 19, 20, 20. Yeah. 20 was half a season, so yeah. there's one full year. 18, did he even 19, pitch in 21. 20? Yeah, he did. Well, no, he no, didn't no. Pitch, he didn't Tommy pitch in 21. He had pit, yeah, he didn't pitch in 21 because yeah. of Tommy John. Yeah. So, But he either way, yeah. when he was on the bump for Houston, very, very Especially, successful. Especially, like you mentioned earlier last year, where he won the Cy Young. And it. Age, you're at, probably not supposed to win the Cy Young yet. No. One no. of the oldest in baseball history, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, because y- y- once you get, uh, to me, a pitcher's shelf life, once you get past the age of 32, 33, you start to go down a little bit. Oh, yeah, bit, that's unless, the end of your prime. Uh, yeah, unless your name's like, you know, Randy Johnson, or in this case, Justin Verlander. Yeah, pitchers usually have about a, a four-year window, four and a half. You could stretch it to five, but it usually starts about 27, 28, and then it goes to, like you said, about 32, 33 is when that, that prime starts to end and you start really heading towards the end of your career as a starting pitcher. Right. Very rarely do you see a guy past 33 yeah. still be able to you know hurl a ball very well, like I said, unless your name's Randy Johnson, JV, yeah. Felix Hernandez, people like that. So right. very good trade for the Astros. And to me, I think this is going to give the Astros much – the much needed momentum that they've needed. Mm-hmm. They've were they've been able to stay afloat despite all the injuries. And then the Rangers started tripping over themselves like I expected them to. So they're they're not in fourth they're not in fourth place like I said they would be by right. middle, by the middle of August. But so they're still being competitive. I'll give them that. But I think this is critical for the Astros to be able to not only, you know, solidify your spot in the postseason, but possibly make a run at a top seed as the winners of the West. You know, and it and the thing is too with, with this whole Rangers thing, you know, as much as I hate to admit it, and I've said this before on the podcast, with the way that these moves turned out, I was kind of skeptical, as I think most people were, at them basically playing Yankee Bowl, mm-hmm. where they were basically buying half of their positions, but they felt it was the right move and I mean, so far it's paid off. They still haven't given up the division lead since the beginning of April. So Granted, something is th- working. They're close. They're to close giving it up, but for the first time since the beginning of April, right? Which is basically the beginning of the season. So something's been working. You know, even with losing, you know, a ton of pitchers, even with having other injuries, even Corey Seager coming back last night mm-hmm. hit a bomb, huge home run in the right center. So. You know, it, it is a competitive team, and it's the reality is the Rangers are, at least if they continue the way that they played this year, if they continue it the next few years, and they continue to build on it, they're here to stay for a bit. So it's a matter of how do the Astros compete with it, and that's one reason why they went and got Verlander. Because mm-hmm. if you remember as well, Dana Brown came out with a quote the day before the deadline, uh, July 31st, and said, our focus is not starting pitching. We want another arm in the bullpen, and we want a lefty bat. 
They didn't get the lefty bat. They the that quote was made after they already got Graveman, but when you have the opportunity to get Verlander, you know you can't pass it. It's up. too hard to pass it. Plus, I honestly also feel like that quote was a smokescreen. Oh, for sure. And I think a little bit of a leverage play to to get extra on that on that Mets deal for Verlander. But point being, you know, it, it helps now because you can take one of your starters and you can throw him in as a long reliever. Yes. You know, basically fill the what I believe should be the position of Lance McCullers as a long reliever mm-hmm. in your bullpen. Because, you know, yeah, you've had guys struggle a little bit um, throughout this season. Montero hasn't been consistent enough, as I think most people would like him to be. You know, uh, you know, Naris is in a, a club option year, so his performance is really being kind of under the, the, the microscope, if you will. Um, you know, you, you've had some good performance. Some other guys, obviously, Presley is Presley, one of the better closers in baseball. You get Graven back to help out the back end on a on a setup role, mm-hmm. um, and take it back to the days of twenty one, basically. Basically, um, so it it helps a lot, um, you know, and and that's something that I I've said it multiple times on this podcast. The Astros needed to get at least a starter during the winter meetings, at, at, if not a bullpen guy. And now that they've got both, I feel a lot better especially now that guys are coming off of injury and they're coming back and actually, you know, here, then, uh, you know, I feel a lot better yeah. about this team than I did two, two and a half months ago. So, so we'll, we'll see what happens there. So enough Astros talk. Let's look around <laughs> some other teams around the league that made some moves and yeah. some were buyers. Some were definitely sellers. One seller in particular, the St. Louis Cardinals uh, mm-hmm. making two big deadline moves on the first, of course, sending Jack Flaherty, their ace, in their rotation to Baltimore. In exchange, the Cardinals were able to land three of the Orioles' prospects, infielder Cesar Prieto, left-hander Drew Rahm, and right-hander Zach Showalter. So, obviously, big seller there. And then the other trade they made, of course, was sending their shortstop Paul DeYoung to Toronto, Mm -hmm. along with some uh, moolah, along for uh, right-hander in Matt Svonson. So, Obviously, the Cardinals are not in any position to compete. They're 48-61 and 61 at the bottom of the NL Central. Obviously, we knew they were going to be sellers at the deadline, and yeah. they ship off some you know, rather tasty uh, players over to other teams that are going to be competing for a spot in the October baseball. Yeah, and especially with, with the move that the Orioles made, getting, getting that started, getting that guy in Flaherty to help out their rotation, that's really going to help their case in the East. A game and a half over the Rays right now, they have. They both have 66 wins, but the Orioles have played three less games, so they have three less mm-hmm. losses with 42, Rays at 45. And then right behind it, outside looking in more of a wild card team would be the Blue Jays sitting in third at 60 and 49. Um, the Yankees still at the bottom of the division at 56 and 52, and they're not really going to be competing for a, a division title or even a playoff spot in general unless, you know, something weird happens. Now, I say that. You have the Central, so they could sneak in as a wild card. They technically, I believe, have the – okay, it's weird. I think they're either tied it's, for the third spot or they're tied for fourth. It's kind of weird how some of these records are. Um, are you talking about the uh, wild card? Yeah. Right there's, Boston and New York are on the outside looking in right now. Yeah, so they're they're tied for that, that first spot, I believe, right on the outside because uh, everybody in the Central is under – the Red Sox fifty seven wins and the Yankees fifty six. Yeah, the, the wild card race as of so. this as of this moment is it is Tampa Bay five games up on uh, Boston. Mm-hmm. Houston's in the second wild card spot, two games up. Toronto holds that third wild card spot. Boston's two and a half back. Yankees three and a half back, tied with Seattle. And then you got the Angels half a game behind them, and then Cleveland's three games back after that. So that's really the wild card race right now. It's eight teams vying for three spots. It's a it's a very fun race because everybody's within a couple of wins of each other. And, it's and not that, like it's like a five game separation between fifth and sixth. It's like one win. Right. And, and the thing, the f- fact of the matter is, division races are still mixed in there as well mm-hmm. because in the East, Baltimore clear down to Boston is still in it. I mean, Boston's nine back, but you know, there's still a lot of baseball to be played. We've seen crazy your things happen the central of course you know minnesota and cleveland are separated by two games detroit's only six and a half back there so they're not out of it by any stretch and then of course you got the west texas all the way down to anaheim it's six and a half so th- this al race for the postseason is first off far from over mm-hmm. but it is insane to think about that you got what five eight 
12 of the 15 teams mm-hmm. in the American League still in a position to make the postseason. And that's the thing with the, the American League usually every year is that it's it's at least competitive. Now, this is one of the more competitive years, I would think, in the last, you know, comparing the last five, it's one of the more competitive, especially now that the West is starting to kind of close in a little bit because usually it's just been the Astros dominating. So now the fact that the Rangers are getting better, the Mariners are kind of retooling this year, but they're still in it, and the Angels decided we're going to try to push for a postseason, you know, that kind of helping close the gap in the West a bit helps the overall competitiveness Mm -hmm. of the American League because usually it was just the East that was usually a kind of a a dice toss or dice roll every year. But, I mean, yeah, it's going to be fun to see. But like I said, I feel like that getting Flaherty really helps solidify to everybody in Baltimore and everybody in the East that, hey, Orioles are here. They're here to stay. We're going to win the East. You're going to have to catch up to us. Yeah. It's going to be a matter of, for me, it's going to be a matter of can the Rays catch up? It because be. I really don't think the Blue Jays are going to catch up. I think six and a half, even though there's still two months of baseball left to be played, I still think six and a half is a little too much for it being the Orioles. Now, let's mm-hmm. say if it was Red Sox or Yankees, even the Rays, maybe. Or even if it wasn't the Blue Jays in there, maybe if it was the Orioles or maybe if it was the Rays in third, I could see them having a better shot at catching up. I don't see the Blue Jays catching up for a shot at the West, uh, the East Division. Mm-hmm. So I'm thinking it's a it's a two man race between Baltimore and Tampa Bay. That one's going to be fun to watch, but I really feel like honestly, there is a decent chance that each one of these divisions in the American League, and we'll jump to the National League here in a little bit as well after we go over a few more trades. Uh, there could be 163s for each of these divisions. Oh, yeah. Especially yeah. the West with it being a half-game difference. That, Absolutely. That's probably going to stay within two games the entire rest of the year, let's be honest. The only way it would be is if some one of them, hit, one of them being either the Rangers or the Astros, hits a skid. Right. So, which I don't think that's going to happen for right. either team, so we'll see what happens. Um, so, yeah, looking at some of these other trades, a brief touch, uh, the Phillies getting a nice arm to their rotation, getting Michael Lorenzen from Detroit in exchange for Howie you Lee. Uh, sending him to Philadelphia. Now, here, now, if you really want to flip to the National League, Jordan, mm-hmm. a team that stunned me buying at the deadline, mm-hmm. the San Diego Padres, getting the services of Scott Barlow from Kansas City uh, in exchange yeah. for righty Henry Williams, and then the other one, the bigger one, the Padres getting the ageless wonder left-handed Rich Hill <laughs> and the first baseman G-Man Choi yeah. from Pittsburgh, and they sent over lefty Jackson Wolf. Outfielder Estuar Suero and first baseman Alvonso Rivas to Pittsburgh, who's obviously – they looked competitive earlier this year, but they're obviously going to become sellers now. But, man, the Padres buying? So this one's interesting for me in the aspect of this entire trade deadline revolves around Juan Soto because of the fact that he's set to become a free agent. There's a good chance that they're not going to be able to bring him back with the money he's going to want for how well he's been playing, or I say how well he's been playing. He's been having a down year, but he's going to want more money than I think the Padres are wanting to give him. So I think what they're trying to do, like you're saying, is see about pushing, because they're probably not going to win the West, try to push for their, for a wild card spot, and have that be the driving force of take a little less, we'll give you incentives for performance so you can make the money up elsewhere, but stay with us. Yeah. And I think that's what they're trying to do is use this as a ploy to keep Juan Soto and re-sign him in the offseason. Now, will that work? Probably not. If they don't make the playoffs, he's definitely gone. No. And I don't think there's any question about Without that. Without a doubt. It's a matter of are they going to be able to compete for a wild card spot? And they can. It's a lot easier right now with just the win difference. you got about four wins separating between you and – uh, if you're the Padres at 54 and the top wild card team at 58, whether it being the Phillies, Marlins, and Brewers, all at 58 wins, I say that the Do- the Giants technically are the lead wild card at 60. But point is, it's only four games to second place, five to first place. It's six to first in the West. But point being, at least if you can get into that top three, obviously you make it. If you can get second, it helps out a little bit in your favor because you get to host the wild card game. But or the playing game, if you will, whatever it is. But um, 
But yeah, this is really a move that centers around doing what we can to make the postseason and have that be the convincing factor to keep Juan Soto in the offseason at a discount. Right. I don't know if it's going to work. It probably won't, in my opinion. They're just a little too far behind, and they just haven't really shown that they're going to figure it out, in my opinion, You know, especially with the fact that you're 25 and 30 on the road. Mm-hmm. Not going to help you out at all. But I don't know. I... Yeah, I, I like I said, this move is basically based to basically a way to convince Juan Soto that hey, the team's actually trying to win. They also did make another trade on deadline day. They got first baseman Garrett Cooper out of Miami, along with righty Sean Reynolds, to send Ryan Weathers over to Miami. So that mm-hmm. was just another you know depth piece for the Padres. So. We'll see if it pans out for them. I don't know if it will or not, but we will see. Uh, One trade that kind of got swept under the rug and kind of stood out to me. So the Mets did a little bit of buying at the deadline. They brought in Phil Bickford and Adam Kolarik from the Dodgers in exchange Uh for just cash. So they are just trying to, you know, bolster the bullpen for the long run. I think that's what I got out of that trade. Um, The Dodgers also, on their end of buying, got lefty Ryan Yarbrough from Kansas City in exchange for Devin Mann and shortstop Derlin Figueroa. So another another pitching piece for Los Angeles as well. And and it's funny because you look at, you know, the Mets, you know, selling. Like you said, a little buying, but mostly selling their their assets, basically saying, it didn't work. Mm-hmm. You know, the the spending the 400 million, whatever we spent in the offseason, it didn't work. Everybody got hurt, and we're going to try this experiment later. I kind of wonder if this was the plan all along to have all of these guys, top players, and then trade them to get all the prospects to have long-term success. Because according to a quote, I forget who reported it. I want to say it was either MLB off Fox or somebody else, Bleacher Report maybe. I'm not sure. But somebody came out with a quote from the New York Mets GM, Billy Epler, that said, our goal is to be competitive in 2025, 2026. That's when we want to be competitive, fight for a division title, and try to win a World Series. Them saying that the – he said that trading Scherzer, whenever they did trade Scherzer to the Rangers, that wasn't saying it's a rebuild. They're going at it as a retooling. That's why they went and got some other mm-hmm. bullpen pieces and some other arms at the deadline, like you said, to, I guess, try to convince whoever they needed to convince that this isn't a rebuild. Um, but I don't know. It's just it's been a weird half season for the New York Mets. Now, granted, you have to remember Billy Upler is the guy who built the the. Angels from 2015 to 2020. So not a great roster, but he was able to land Shohei Otani. He yeah. was able to keep Mike Trout on a very, well, I say keep Trout on a very long, you know, long-term deal. But he yeah. never had Trout come to him and say, get rid of me. This team isn't winning. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and it's not like the rosters have been terrible for L.A. They just haven't performed or they've been injured, you know. <coughs> uh, Rendon. Exactly. That's exactly who I had, had in mind. So I'm glad you caught that. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but the point being... You know, it, it's kind of a weird move. Look at the Mets. I'm not really sure what they're, why they decided to spend all the money if they were just going to get rid of them in six months. But right. either way, I'm not sitting in that front office. I don't get paid enough to know what they're saying. But, you know, it's, I don't know. It, 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 it's a weird season. I'm interested to see what kind of trades they do in the off season, if they make any at all. Um, or if they're just going to do the you know, standard, get a couple free agents, wait for the prospects to get up there, and we'll figure it out in a couple of years' time. Getting away from deadline day itself, looking at some previous trades on the 31st and beyond, some rapid-fire ones your way on the 31st. Arizona made a couple of trades, their first one, or their second one being – uh, getting Jace Peterson from Oakland, getting him out of that hellhole, and then bringing in righty Chad Patrick and sending him over to Oakland. Uh, another trade, Giants were able to get the services of outfielder A.J. Pollock and utility man Mark Mathias from Seattle for a player that is to be named later. Uh, the Cubs were able to land third baseman Jamer Candelario from Washington in exchange for two prospects, Kevin Maid and D.J. Hers. Uh, another quiet one that kind of got swept under the rug, uh, the Brewers getting Mark Canna from the Mets uh, for righty 
Justin Jarvis. Mm-hmm. A big one on the 31st. The first big trade the D-backs made was getting Paul Sewell from Seattle, and then they sent a haul. Is that how you say that? Paul Sewell, yes. I've always said Seawold. <laughs> I believe it's Sewell. I don't know. Either way. Either way. Either way. <laughs> That's got, not important. Seattle got a big haul out of it, getting infielder Josh Rojas, who was a part of the Zach Granke mm-hmm. trade that sent Granke to Houston and Rojas to Arizona. They also got outfielder and first baseman Dominic Canzoni and infielder Ryan Bliss. That was a big trade for Arizona, a team that is still very much alive in the race for the NL West. So big, big arm out of their bull, to add to their bullpen. And another, uh, another trade, a couple of them at least, that I want to highlight. Uh, on the 30th, the Angels getting C.J. Crone mm. and Randall Gritchick for uh, Jake Madden and Mason Albright. That was big. Uh, that was a good one for the Angels to show. We're going to try to compete. I was kind of surprised that Colorado got rid of Crone, but I'm not surprised at the same time. The, didn't Crone have a stint with Anaheim? Yeah, that's yeah. where he started. So he um, can, so he's coming home. And then the other one, and the trade I'm going to call the Colin Neal trade. Mm. Aaron Savali going to Tampa Bay. From the Guardians for Kyle Manzardo. Um, yeah. F- folks, for, for <laughs> preference, we call it the Colin Neal trade. And if you don't know who Colin Neal is, he's one of our part-time staffers here. He does uh, Lady Hornet basketball and Huntsville baseball, mm-hmm. which we're going to talk about here in our final note, of course. But he, God bless him, he, he, he wanted Aaron Savali to come to Houston. He was just so gung-ho about it, like, we need Aaron Savali here. And this was back in the talk whenever we were in the talks for this Dylan Cease. This was three Cease. weeks ago, folks. We were in the talks for Dylan Cease. And, yeah. you know, obviously he never ended up getting dealt anyway. Right. But he wanted Aaron Savali over Dylan Cease. And, well, Tampa Bay swoops in on the 31st and is able to land Aaron Savali. And that, that's huge for Tampa Bay because that's a very good arm you're adding to a bullpen that is shot to death. I mean, right. not a bullpen, a rotation that is shot to death because mm-hmm. you don't have Shane Boz out there. Uh, I believe, and you don't have Tyler Glass now. Right. So, good move for them. And that that's huge. And it, then you it, were you, you were able to. The fact is, they were able to get him a one for one, straight up yeah. trade. Nothing else in the trade. So that there was, was big. a lot of those. I was kind of surprised at how many one for ones there were because when it got closer to the deadline, obviously more players started getting involved, more package deals started happening, more cash considerations started happening, which is nothing unusual. You see that the closer you get to the deadline, but. The amount of one for ones that there were leading up to even three or four days before the deadline was kind of surprising to see. Um, but yeah, and, and you know, you look back at it, the Jack Flaherty trade for the Orioles is basically a response to Tampa Bay getting Savali. Yeah, because you and it's the same thing with the Rangers and Astros. Mm-hmm. Rangers go and get Max Scherzer. The Astros respond and say, "Okay, well, we'll do you one better. We'll get your teammate. We'll get your teammate, Justin Verlander." So. It's kind of the same situation there in the East as it is in the West with the, the two top you know, teams in the division kind of going back and forth with each other in an arms race, basically. Pretty much. That's what it um, was. So, yeah, no, it's it's been interesting to see, you know, especially the amount of arms that Texas has got and Jordan Montgomery, Chris Stratton as well from the Cardinals. I believe you highlighted that earlier. Um, you know, I don't know. It There's a lot of arms dealt. In this trade deadline, Dodgers getting Lance Lynn and Joe Kelly. Yep. Joe Kelly back on the team for the first time in what? Just a couple of years. A couple of years, yeah. So it's, you know, it, and, it, yeah. And, and, and we had mentioned, you know, the Angels earlier in the deadline getting Lucas Giolito and Reynaldo Lopez. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Giolito, his last, his two starts in Anaheim have not been right. great. But I think they were able to counteract that with the other moves they made offensively, so hopefully that evens it out for them there. So, But, yeah, a wild deadline mm-hmm. this year. One of our one of our former colleagues and former t- t- uh, classmates at Sam, uh, I'm not going to mention his name, but he said this is kind of a snooze fest of a deadline, but I was like, no. I mean, I, I feel like everybody that needed to make a trade, uh, at least in terms of the buying teams, mm-hmm. did what they needed to do to be able to get some certain assets to the team. The Astros being one, the Rangers being another, and amongst other teams. Really, it was an AL top-heavy deadline because I looked at the National League. Yeah, mm-hmm. where there, there were some splash moves over there. Yeah. But a lot more quiet ones, to say the least. This was a deadline that was about more of filling gaps for teams who are competing than getting the big flashy names. The flashy names obviously came later, the last two, three days before the deadline actually came. Uh, but, you know, it, it was more so, this trade deadline was more so teams just trying to fill holes and get ready for a run to October, potentially. Mm-hmm. Uh 
you know, Kendall Grayman, Lance Lynn, Joe Kelly all going in the only two trades on the 28th. That's what kind of started the snowball effect, if you will. Right before that, David Robertson going to Miami, you know, Carlos Santana going to Milwaukee for Johnny Severino and another one-to-one with division opponent in Pittsburgh. Yep. So, you know, it's kind of one of those. You mentioned Giolito, Ronaldo Lopez the day before. But other than that, it's when you start getting to, you know, two, three, four days before, the only trade on the 29th, Max Scherzer. That's when you started really seeing a snowball effect of everybody else going, well, hold on a minute. They're just going to give them up for – they're going to give them cash and just only get one player. Okay. Right. Things are happening. Let's let's start doing things here. There was talks about Bednar getting traded. I said I would have loved to have him in a back end, but I am perfectly fine with Graveman as well. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's – and looking back on it, I'm kind of glad that Bednar didn't get traded from the Pirates. You know, so he can be there next year I was gonna for say when that, they that hopefully make a wild card run. I mean, yeah. But, you know, it, it's so – it was more so a a late heavy because there were reports – there was four or five different trades that were being reported after the deadline because some people were like, wait, why are trades happening? It's after the deadline. No, they the, weren't. you have to wait for the teams to leak the information right. in order to <laughs> – be able to have the information Pe- publicly. People just don't realize that <laughs> sometimes. So. Team teams won't announce the trade the moment they they start to get it approved before they can announce. Right. It, it was a it was approved. It was sent in prior mm-hmm. to the end of the deadline. Uh, uh, what was it? Five o'clock central our time yeah. here. So we'll see. But that sets the stage now. Now that the deadline has come and passed, mm-hmm. the next big thing obviously is September call ups. But yep. really, right now at this point, it is full. Steam ahead to October baseball. We already talked about the AL race, so I want to briefly touch on the NL race before we step aside. Yeah, uh, division leading Atlanta, just <laughs> running away with the the NL. Nobody's right now. catching them. No, best no, record in baseball not. right now. Best record in baseball, and they if they win tomorrow against the Cubs, that will give them to win seventy. So they're 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 shaping up for a big first team to seventy this season. Yeah, they are a they are a huge favorite to be the representative yeah. for the NL in the World Series. Oh, yeah. The Dodgers currently in a tight race in the a, in the NL West. They lead the division now at sixty one and forty five. But San Francisco's right there. Uh, how about Cincinnati hanging around with the Central fifty nine and fifty one? I thought they were going to taper off maybe, but nope, they're still hanging in there. But then in the, LA we trust. Yes, in LA we trust. <laughs> But this wild card race mm-hmm. in the NL is insane. I mean, even before that, look at the NL Central period. Half game behind the division leading Reds is the Brewers. Yep. Three games behind the Reds is the Cubs. And technically, they were still at the deadline, so they're going to taper off. But nine and a half back are the Pirates. They're not going to compete, obviously. They weren't well, and, really and, planning and, on and, it. And, but and, 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 and you've six. got three teams within three games of each other for the NL Central title. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's, it's looking like the wild card. <laughs> it, it literally is. I mean, the, the, I've always said that the AL Central and NL Central had a lot of similarities, but mm-hmm. this year they really do. Yeah. Um, when Except you, the NL Central actually has more teams. All their teams have a winning record. Right. They're, they're or more, at least the top it, three. It's at least more competitive <laughs> than the AL side. Yeah. But then you look at the wild card. San Francisco leads at the top, two games up on Arizona, at the, who is the first team looking in. Philadelphia back from the dead, getting mm-hmm. hot at the right time. That seems to be their MO. They're at 58 and 50. They're the holders of the second wild card. It's a tie for the third wild card between Miami and Milwaukee. As of the moment of this recording, Miami is currently in action against Philadelphia, so that's a huge game today. Oh, yeah. Uh, so you got so Milwaukee. They're going to play Pittsburgh tonight, so we'll see how that pans out. Arizona is a game back. They're playing San Francisco tonight, so, man, mm-hmm. lots of teams right there at the top of the wild card playing each other in it's a gonna series. It's going to be a punching bag of a wild card. Indeed. And then you got the Cubs against Cincinnati tonight. Yep. They're at 55 and 53, two and a half back. San Diego, this is why they were kind of buyers at the deadline. They're only four games back of the last wild card spot. They right. start their series with the Dodgers tomorrow. So that'll be a critical series for them if they want to make any sort of headway. The Mets are seven back, mm-hmm. so they're not out of it. But but they sold off every sellable asset that you could have sold at the deadline if you if unless your name was Pete Alonso, which you'll take care of in the winter meetings like you alluded to. Yeah. They're probably gonna taper off. They're yeah. they're in a series with Kansas City right now, but Kansas City's won five straight. Yeah. So that that's not a gimme. And then yeah, Pittsburgh nine back, but They'll probably taper off as well, and then the rest is the rest of the NL. So, <laughs> um, 
it's going to be a wild finish. And, folks, we're going to document all of it here on the podcast as this season progresses. We get closer and closer to October. Mm Mm-hmm. Who are going to be the ones that come out of the pack? Who, uh, right now, as of this moment, if you want me to make any sort of prediction, I'm going to be a little bold here, and I'm going to say it's going to be a Baltimore-Houston ALCS. And on the flip side of that, uh, for the NL side of things, I think it will be hmm, it will be an Atlanta-San Francisco NLCS. So. Interesting. I yeah. I'm, I I I'm gonna, I mean I know for a fact Atlanta will be the representative in the World Series for the. If NL. they're not, something went wrong. Yeah, something kind went, of like some, Germany not making out of the not, the group stage. Yes, for the first time ever. You see, so you caught yourself there in a weird point because I know you're going to say knockout, but then it sounded like something else. So I'm okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to let it go. Okay. I'm going to let it go. But yeah, you're right. You're right. You're absolutely right. So we'll we'll see what Atlanta does down the stretch. We'll see how everything pans out. You know, folks, who knows? Some, some Seattle and Los Angeles, the Angels could come out of nowhere and <laughs> just, you know, blow everything to bits. So that would be funny. That would be very funny. And, you, you know, Boston and New York are, you know, being pesky like they always are every year. But yeah. it's been it's been a weird baseball year. It's been long enough to where we can tell they're not going to be in the playoffs. Yeah. So. so we'll see what happens. All right, folks. Well, uh, well, uh, that's all the deadline baseball stick and ball sport talk we'll talk about. Coming up next is our final note. We're going to talk about, of course, the brand new era that is now launched for the Hornet Nation Broadcast Network. So we're going to do a full deep dive into that coming up after the break. Cole Strunner cutting it back across the 40. Cole Strunner, 50, 45, 40, 35, 30. Trying to step one more man. Oh, he's spun down at the 25-yard line. Butler for three. Good. Gives it the twine at the right wing. Deep three. Got it. In time. The Hornets are heading to the postseason. Swing and a miss. It's over. Boom. Huntsville to the regional quarterfinals. And welcome back, everybody, here on the KCM Sports Podcast. I'm Carlos Zimmerman. Alongside of me is Jordan Smith. Time to talk about our final note, and it's a big one, of course, because if you did not see, and if you want to go see it, go on to the here on the channel, on the 101.7 KCM channel, and check out that video after we are finished up here. Uh, we have launched uh, the Hornet, relaunched, really, the Hornet Nation Broadcast Network with a rebrand. It's got its own logo now and everything, if you haven't already seen it on our social media. And, of course, we've got a lot more in store coming up this season you know Jordan over here not to blow you know anything up his skirt he has been hard at work since the December of 2022 when we decided you know what we need to let the Hornets have an, like a sort of broadcast identity mm-hmm. we weren't sure what it was going to be at that time but we know we wanted to model it around the Hornet Nation broadcast network because that's yeah. what we've you know called it on our broadcast you know ever since we started doing video broadcasting mm-hmm. back in the fall of 2020 so it's exciting. I, I, you know, we there's a lot that we have in the works, and you know, we'll tease a little of that, he, a little bit of that here right now in the final note. But Jordan, you know, first off, you've done a phenomenal job. Thank you, to say the least, with everything that's been going on with rebranding this and everything, and all the on-screen stuff that these folks are going to see. Just, you know, you're the ma- you're the mastermind <laughs> behind all of this. I kind of want, I'll let you take it here and see, like you know, tease a little bit of what, you know, Hornet Nation's going to get really excited about, especially coming up in the coming weeks. So the the whole thing with this this presentation is trying to make it more of an experience because, you know, for Hornet football, for example, you have two different broadcasts, right? You have the FM broadcast on 101.7 KSAM, the right. flagship for Hornet football, uh, and then you have the video stream that, coincides with that. It's a little bit different experience that, you know, you know, you see it a lot more in the state of Texas, at least, and around the country now with, you know, streaming getting more popular, especially after 2020, that really starting to become more popular with, you know, the, the whole pandemic and the, yeah. the regulations at that time of how many people were allowed to go to the games, things like that. That's when it really started kicking off as a, as a popular option for teams and networks and things like that. I mean, cause you couldn't uh, go out. Yeah, exactly. You couldn't go to the games more times than not. So, you know, it was really the only option. So that's when, you know, things really started kicking off. Like you said, that's when we started doing video aspect. Um, 
But as far as this, it was a matter of taking what we had done in the past and building on it because, you know, it's something that was easily able to build upon. You know, it's something that, that was, you know, as long as you knew what you were doing, it wasn't hard to create it, you know. And it's something that I think when people see it, especially with this first game on August 18th, the scrimmage against Lufkin, that'll be a YouTube-only game. So subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Um, but it'll be a brand new experience. Yes. You'll have a bunch of motion graphics on screen that will help supplement um, the the broadcast. You'll need to get a little bit more information um, than you did previously, um, and cr- try to replicate as much of a you know different experience as possible than what you've had before. But also creating more of a TV style broadcast experience to really show, one, what we're capable of with our broadcast, and two, show something to the Huntsville community that they've deserved from day one. Yes. Uh, so it's, you know, it's a, it's a lot of, you know, video um, changes. There's some audio changes as well. Uh, and, again, that will all be revealed at the Lufkin game uh, and then especially at that first home game. Uh, on August 25th, that'll really get to against AM Consolidated the next week. That'll really get to kind of see more of the the new changes. And of course, whenever we get to you know basketball, boys and girls, and then baseball and softball, especially with the new facility out there for Huntsville, um, really get to see a lot of the new changes and some other things we have in store. But you know, as, as Coach Rodney Southern told you and I in meetings that we've had over the last however many months, you know, he wants it to be like an actual sports network. He wants it to be more of a network, you know, more content. We're going to bring you all as well every week um, and just creating a better experience in general uh, for these broadcasts, both visually and audio wise. Um, it, it's, it'll take us a little bit of, you know, I think, you know, we, we, getting there, used there, to on the front end, there will or the be, back end, I should say. There but. will be some tinkering <laughs> that, yeah. we'll, that we'll have to make, we'll make adjustments at, especially after the Lufkin scrimmage, you know, we'll, right. we encourage you if you're going to watch that, you know, Feel free to, um, you know, my email is available on the KSAM Sports Facebook. Shoot me an email if yeah. you want some, uh, if you want some, if you want to provide some input. Please. <laughs> we, 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 th- we want this to be, you know, for you, the viewer. Mm-hmm. Th- this is for you, the fan, you know, the, you know, the grandparent that may not be able to make it out to a ball game. Right. You know, a friend that lives across the country and you want to see your friend play, play, play ball. So th- this is about you. So if you have any sort of suggestions, once you see everything that we've that he's been working on and that we put out there for you, starting at the Lufkin game and then of course at the season opener afterwards, please mm-hmm. let us know. Yeah. And because we, we want to make this the best possible, because like Jordan said, this this community has deserved something like this for a very long time. Like you said, from day one when we started doing this video broadcasting mm-hmm. and we've always been capable of doing it, but I'm glad now that we're actually being able to see the fruits of our labor, if you will, right. <laughs> to make it happen. Yeah. You know, and it's, it, it's going to be, it's going to be a good experience. You know, obviously all the games are still on YouTube. Uh, all the games are still free for all y'all to watch. That's not changing. It's easy to watch, easy to access, of course, as well. The coaches shows for football season are all also in the YouTube channel. That'll have a little bit different of a visual experience as well. Um, so that'll be uh, something to watch for. So again, first one for that is the 21st. Mm-hmm. So definitely tune in for that as well. Again, those are all up on the YouTube channel, all 10 uh, episodes for that, or at least the streams for that. Um, but it's it's going to be a new experience. You know, yes. It's going to be something that, you know, like I said, there's a lot of different motion graphics. There's a lot more visual aspects that are changing, a lot more personalization with kind of the, the presentation, if mm-hmm. you will. Um, so it's it, it may be a little bit of a of a overstimulating change, if you will, for I think some people. Um, I know for me at least there <laughs> – it was kind of. You were probably getting overstimulated just making it. I had to make. I had to take a two month break because I was starting to hit a wall yeah. with how much I was, you know, trying to figure out and, and tinker and everything. Right. I had to. That's the thing. 
doing all this since December. There was a two month break where I wasn't making anything. No, no, this. you weren't. You, you so. weren't. I mean, we didn't. I think it was like towards the end of the last athletic season. You something like you, that. You yeah, kind of set it aside. Like this little project, I'm gonna I'm gonna put this over. I here need for to take a, a break. Bit. <laughs> and then once yeah. sum, and then once summer hit and there was nothing else going on. I all mean, right. what else are we gonna do? Right, exactly. So, but so. yeah, it's it's. It's going to be a good experience, at least I hope it is, for everybody watching home. Like Carlos said, if you have suggestions, uh, positive and negative, uh, you know, as far we, as we things can, that we you can, can improve on, whatever. We you can know. take constructive criticism. Exactly. Please let us know. We want, like Carlos said, to make sure that this is a, you know, a better experience and a good experience for you because at the end of the day, you are the person that's watching. So we want to make sure it is the best experience possible for you um, as well as, you know, making sure that, you know, we're expanding on our capabilities. We're, we're growing our team here at the KSAN Sports Network. Uh, we're, you know, still hiring people, you know, as well. We want, you know, Huntsville High School students, if you're watching this and, you know, you, you want to, you know, try to get in on the action with all of these broadcasts and find a way to get yourself on the production team, camera crew, whatever, you know, let us know. You can head to our website at KSAN1017.com. We have an application you know, on our website, if you want to join us and be a part of the team. You must be 16 years or older. You must be 16 years or older. That is correct. Um, thank you for putting the, the legal stuff in there. Yes. And that, all of that stuff is also listed in the uh, in the job listing. So if you forget, you can also look there. Um, but, you know, it's it's a new experience. I'm excited for what, what we're creating. I'm excited for what will debut in 15 days' time. No pressure. <laughs> Wow. No pressure for, for us, you know. But that, that's <laughs> me trying up. to get everything figured. Look, that snuck up so fast. Yeah, because like, and, and and you know, it's it's not just for you guys, the viewer as well. You know, I want you know, at least from my personal experience, you know, working with all these students for the last few years, I want it to be a great experience for the athletes that we cover as well. Because you know, a lot of them, I've come to realize, they go back and watch the stuff after they come off the field, mm -hmm. and they, uh, for instance, one of them, um, I, I won't I won't say him by name. I don't want to embarrass them, but <laughs> they, uh, their mom puts the game on after and they watch it back yeah. in full after, you know, That's going funny. through the two and a half hour game, three hour game. They go back and watch it back immediately when they get home That's just awesome. so that they can get ready for the next week. That's awesome. I don't know whether it's just to listen to our side of it and see what we said about the game itself. Probably or, not. It, but. <laughs> or, or they just want to, you know, use it as game film as well, Probably. because that's what a lot of these players do as well. They go back and they look at it yeah. for game film purposes. And now that we're able to move into, we're able to move into these facilities with them, brand spanking new facilities, especially mm -hmm. with baseball and softball. We're going to be able to provide angles that you've never had before. We kind of teased it a little bit this last year, mm -hmm. but now we're taking it to another level, and now I'm going to leave it at that. But yeah. like I said, it, this is about, you know, this community. This is who we do it for. This is not so that, you know, we can look good. I mean, it looks great right. from what I've seen, from what you've shown me, but mm -hmm. it's not for our, our glory. It's for, you know, this community to enjoy. And that's the goal and the passion that me and Jordan have. And I can say the same for the rest of our crew as well. You know, personnel wise, we're not really changing. If anything, we're adding, right. We're, we're adding a lot more people that we've had on there, you know, getting to bring back two great guys like Christian Cortez and Houston Hardcastle is our primary camera operators. It's great to bring them back. We've gotten a few more on staff now as well. Joining us, uh, Luke is going to be back on Hornet boys basketball. Um, Kendall Morris is going to be shifting to be my sideline reporter uh, for me and Brian uh, during Hornet football, and she'll also become a field reporter as she was at the end of the uh, softball season mm -hmm. last year. Um, and Luke's going to jump on with me to the softball games. And, yes, this is going to be my last year of doing Hornet softball. Sorry. Sad but tear. I know. <laughs> this will be my last year of doing Hornet softball, but I'm, I'm looking forward to that one as well. Colin's going to be, of course, be back on girls basketball and Hornet baseball. Mm -hmm. So, not much else has changed on the personnel side. Just we're adding, and mm. you know we want you know multiple pe multiple people to get experience on doing this if it's for their career, or if they just want to have fun and make a little bit of money on right, the side exactly. as well. Yeah. So there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's originally how I got into this business, <laughs> and I'm still here. So right. you know right. I'm excited. You know I, Jordan's excited that August 18th game. Like I said, it's going to sneak up in a hurry, but I'm excited. <laughs> to be able to go out there to Lufkin and, you know, be able to un unveil it for all of you to be able to get this new experience of the Hornet Nation Broadcast Network. So it's it's very exciting. It is, you know, and like you said, I'm excited to get out there to Lufkin and, 
and, and just get this underway. I've been, you know, annoying you for <laughs> with all this since, like you said, December of last year. Um, I'm sure you you were tired of me talking about it in January, um, but <laughs> <laughs> but you know it, it's it's been a long road to get here. It I has. will say it um, has. So the fact that it's you know right around the corner is exciting, but also the scariest thing in the world. Right. <laughs> You know, it's, um, it's going to be nerve wracking because yeah. you're you're gonna you're gonna get out there and be like, if you know one little thing you know doesn't go right, you're gonna be like, the whole world is crashing. I know the whole world's <laughs> crashing down. Like, oh, why is this internet not working and whatever? Because right. we've had that tendency when we Ugh. go out on road trips. But you know, that's part of the experience. Yeah, you can't always rely on technology to work work in your favor because it's technology. That's why we have backup plans. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So. Like I said, on behalf of Jordan and, you know, the entire KSAM Sports crew, we're very excited to be bringing you this new experience for Huntsville Hornet football, boys and girls basketball, baseball, and softball. It's going to be a very exciting year. And it's not just going to be for this year. This is the norm now. Mm -hmm. This is what it's going to be going forward for, you know, as lo at least as long as I'm here, which there's no timetable on that. I plan to be here as long as the good Lord wills me to be here. We're, we're, we want this to be something that generations of Hornets can enjoy going forward. And and kind of a one final little tease. This is something that there are there are aspects in in this broadcast that um, are things that have never been done before in the Lone Star State when it comes to high school sports broadcasting. So. You know, it, it's not just, you know, oh, we're, you know, adding this or, hey, we're adding more people. It's we're creating an experience that in some regards has never been done before in the Lone Star State. So that's why I say you want to tune in on the 18th, because I promise you it's it's going to be something that I think we're all going to you know, kind of be there on that day on that day thinking, you know, where were we? When when we launched this, you know, you know what what were we doing when we launched it? Or, kind of, what was that moment like? Did or I'll just say this before we wrap it up: Did you and I envision this whenever you and I both came on in the fall right. of 2020? Granted, the world was a completely different place at the time, right there in the middle of the pandemic. Yeah. But did we envision that you know we're gonna get hired on here? We're gonna start doing Hornet broadcasts, and then you know, because lest people forget, you and I both really laid the helped laid the groundwork for where we're at right now, you know, starting off doing, you know, girls basketball and softball, and now it's blossomed into what is going to be revealed on August 18th. Like, yeah. if you told me that when I got here three years ago that we were going to be doing this, I would have been like, he's still here? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm still here? Right. But, but yeah. I say that to say, you know, me, me and Jordan, on behalf of Jordan, we're blessed to, to do this, and I'm so excited. I, I, I want August. I, I wish it was tomorrow. Right. I wish it was tomorrow that we were going to be able to start rolling this stuff yeah. out. But you got to wait 15 more days, folks, until we can finally give you a full reveal into what's right. going to come for football, basketball, baseball, and softball. Just make sure you share the link. Like I said, it's already up on the YouTube channel. Share I'm going to annoy with... the crap out of y'all in the week <laughs> in the week leading up to it because it's going to be on the Facebook page almost every mm -hmm. day, Yeah, that link, yeah. to be able to catch the scrimmage. Because, you know, you're going to want to check out the scrimmage and see what the Hornets have been up to. You know, right. their, their towel scrimmage. It's been a year. Their towel scrimmage is coming up here next week, right. and we're going to be out there checking it out and everything and chatting with players and stuff. And then, of course, like you said, it's been almost a year right. since yeah. uh, you've seen – High school football. Yeah. So you're going to want to check it out. August 18th. Do we have a time? The kickoff on that yet? I want to say, because I'm just going based off of general assumption, probably around 7 o'clock. I would assume so. That's what I'm thinking is about 7 o'clock. Prime time. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, it, my goal, what I would love to see from y'all. Don't know if this will happen first game. It'll be great if it does. Let's get to a point where we have 1,000 people watching at the same time. Let's do that. Why not? Because we've never hit that mark before. No, we never have. You're you're very ambitious. Yeah, I am, and, and that's what I like about you. That's what but this whole thing is about. I know. <laughs> I, I know. I know it is. But, so we'll see. Get the link out, people. Get the link out to people. Get the link and out. We'll uh, we'll have a great we'll have a, we'll have a grand old time this yep. year. I'm I'm very much excited for it. So is Brian as well. I I, I texted him the other day, and he's just so jazzed up about what's going to happen this year for the Hornets and. Yeah. You know, for a guy that was a former Hornet quarterback, he, mm -hmm. he, he is definitely – he's been around for a while, 
and he has gotten to see, you know, every big transition this program's made and right. this being the pinnacle of it, getting your own football stadium, getting your own baseball and softball mm-hmm. complex. So it's exciting. It is. It's it's very exciting. We're almost to an hour. Just an hour. Oh, there I you think go. it's our shortest podcast. Oh, it absolutely is. All right. I opened it. You can wrap it up. All right. Cool. That works. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, that'll do it for us uh, for, for this week, folks. But next week, we'll, uh, we'll kind of dive, I think, a little bit deeper into uh, some of the local sports maybe now that we're yep. getting closer. I know in a couple weeks from now, we'll actually start to do kind of a preview of the Lufkin scrimmage and start right. and breaking things down from there. And the other thing too, folks, we're going to start bringing guests on to the uh, to the show. We're looking forward to having, you know, guests from the Hornets uh, football team joining us. You know, I've already started making those conversations and stuff. Guest hosts are going to start be coming back as our part-time staff returns from their summer sabbatical and are now going to be back here in Huntsville. We're going to be starting to bring on guys like Luke Scott, Colin Neal, Colton Foster from the Huntsville Item will be joining us on the pods here as well as this we get closer and closer to the season beginning. So stay tuned for all of that as we as, as it becomes available. Yeah, so it, it's there's going to be a lot of stuff coming at you, folks. Just be patient with us. We're doing our best. At supersonic speed. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, but uh, but yeah, so just be sure if you haven't done so yet, go ahead and subscribe to the channel, uh, so that way you don't miss out on any of the stuff coming up, whether it's the games, coaches, shows, podcast, any of our regular radio content, anything else we do here at 101.7 KSAM, it'll all go on the YouTube channel, so definitely make sure that you, you subscribe, you turn on notifications, you stick around, and... Uh, hopefully we'll we'll get to a point where we stop talking about baseball on these podcasts. Yeah, I don't want to, but we need to. We've been talking about it the primary for the last month and a half. I, every episode, <laughs> every single episode, every episode. L- so. Luke won't let us hear the end of it. No, no, so. absolutely not. So. Uh, but yeah, so that'll do it for us this week, folks. Uh, again, thank y'all for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you next week again on another episode of the K State Sports Podcast for Carlos Zimmerman. My name is Jordan Smith. Jordan Smith, yeah, if I can say my name right. <laughs> it's been a long day. I have. <laughs> so long, folks. Sting him. <laughs>